in our life. And so we're getting ready to dig in to the Word of God. Who's ready for that today? Amen. 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 Title of the message today is Sacred Spaces in Secular Places. Sacred spaces and secular places. If you've got your Bible or you're looking uh, your Bible on your phone, we're going to be in the book of Esther today. The book of Esther. Anybody know where that is? <laughs> it is in the Bible. Thank you for that. Um, yeah, right before the book of Job. All right. If you've, got, if you've got it on your phone and you're looking, it, it kinda, you can go to where the whole list is and find it that way. Uh, Book of Esther. Well, the average North American person will spend about 88,000 hours or 40% of their total time on earth working at a job. <laughs> Doesn't that sound exciting? 40% yeah. <laughs> of your life working on a job. Then there is, plus, there's time spent doing non-work-related duties that we have to do every week, like driving your car. Who likes to spend a lot of time driving your car? Say, if I'm going on vacation, maybe. Thank you guys th that have come back from vacation. We had others that, since you're back, they left to go on vacation, and they're driving their car. Um, Maybe you're, maybe you're changing diapers, or maybe you're fixing a meal, and maybe you're helping a child with homework. Maybe you're studying for an exam. Maybe you're cooking food, and you're eating, or planting flowers outside, or standing in line at the Department of Motor Vehicles. That seems like it takes half your life when you go there. And so we spend all of this time doing all of these things, from work to other things that we have to take care of, and and we see these things, we view these things as having nothing to do with God. It has nothing to do with God, nothing to do with worship, nothing for advancing the Lord's work here on this earth. And if you think that, you would be wrong. You would be wrong. The great preacher Charles Spurgeon said in a sermon in 1874, he said this, quote, to, to a man who lives unto God, nothing is secular. Everything is sacred. He says he puts on his workday garment, and it is a vestment to him, to the Lord. He sits down to his meal, and it's a sacrament. He eats it as to the Lord. He goes forth to his labor, and therein exercises the office of pre the priesthood. His breath is incense, and his life is a sacrifice. He said he sleeps on the bosom of God and lives and moves in the divine presence. And then he said this, to draw a hard and fast line and say, this is sacred and this is secular, is to my mind diametrically opposed to the teaching of Christ and the spirit of the gospel. In Colossians chapter 3, verses 23 and 24, it says, And whatever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive a reward. Whatever you do, working on your job, driving your car, changing a diaper, whatever you do, do it heartily. Do it as you're doing it unto the Lord, not to people, knowing that from the Lord you're going to receive a reward for doing it that way. Do it like you're doing it for the Lord. You know what? We've been tricked into thinking that there's a secular, neutral ground in our life that is neither for nor against God. But nothing could be further from the truth. A pastor in Portland named John Comer, he, write, he writes this. He says, The cosmic, gargantuan, 24-7 kingdom of God cannot be shrunk down to a few hundred people singing songs in a nice building for an hour every weekend. <laughs> it's not just when we come here that it's sacred. It's wherever we are, and it's whatever we do. It's so much more. In reality, it's about everyday life from the seeming mundane to our work 
to the fun times that we have with family and friends. Everything you do has eternal implications to it. Everything. Today, we're going to talk about the story of Esther. There's ten chapters in that book, and don't worry, we're not going to read every word of ten chapters. I'm going to tell you a little bit of the story today, and then we're going to read a little bit uh, from Esther. But let me tell you where this leads up to where we're going to read today. There was... uh, the people of God were, uh, had been taken off and they were under the rule of a, a king and a kingdom that did not honor God. Didn't care about God, didn't think about God. Oh, they had gods, but it wasn't the God. There's, how many of you know there's only one God? <laughs> there's only one. And so the queen, Queen Vashti, was asked by the king to come to him, but she refused and I'm, I'm, telling, I'm telling a bigger story in a shorter amount of time. Read those 10 chapters in Esther sometime, okay? She was asked to come, and she refused to come to the king, and she was deposed, or she was taken, her queenship was taken away from her, and she was done away with as well. And after this, a search for a new queen came about. There was a Jew, Hadassah was her Jewish name, or Esther, as we know it, was one of the women that was considered to become queen. And it seemed that this happened at the approval of her cousin named Mordecai, who had raised her since she was an orphan. And she wins the favor of the king's eunuch and also the king himself, and she winds up becoming Queen Esther. This would be considered a very secular job since this was in a land that cared nothing about God and didn't look to God or pray to God or care about God. She was queen in a country that knew not God. After a while, a man named Haman was given a title, something like we would say second in command under the king. Mordecai, though, would not bow to Haman, although Haman liked to ask people to do that since he felt important with his title. Mordecai wouldn't bow down to him, given that he was a Jew and he only bowed to God. So Haman, being so angry at Mordecai, came up with a plan to have all the Jews in the kingdom done away with, killed, extinguished, because of his hatred for this one man, Mordecai, who was a cousin of Queen Esther. Nobody knew, Mordecai did, but nobody knew that Esther was a Jew at this time. The king didn't know it. Mordecai got word, though, to Esther about what was going to happen because Haman got the king to agree to do away with all the Jews in the kingdom. So he got word to Esther. Esther was encouraged by Mordecai to go to the king and plead for their lives. And so in Esther chapter 4, we pick it up, starting in verse 11. If you'll look there, Esther chapter 4, starting in verse 11, she sends word to Mordecai in response to his request to go to the king and plead for their lives. So Esther chapter 4, starting in verse 11, says all the king's officials... And the people of the royal provinces, this is Esther's response to Mordecai, okay? All the king's officials and the people of the royal provinces know that for any man or woman who approaches the king in the inner court without being summoned, the king has but one law, that they be put to death unless he extends the golden scepter to them and spares their life. But 30 days have passed Since I was called to go to the king, she's saying, you're asking me to go before the king. He hasn't called me to come. And for people that do that, most of them get their head chopped off. And you're asking me to do that, to risk that. When Esther's words, verse 12, were reported to Mordecai, he sent back this answer. Do not think that because you are in the king's house, you alone of all the Jews will escape. For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place, but you and your father's family will perish. 
And who knows but that you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. Mordecai was seeing that Esther wasn't put there in that position just to have a position in a country that did not acknowledge God. She was put there by God for a purpose and for a reason. Her secular place was going to create a sacred space. Verse 15, then Esther sent this reply to Mordecai. Go gather together all the Jews who are in Susa and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. I and my attendants will fast as you do. When this is done, I will go to the king, even though it's against the law. And if I perish, I perish. So Mordecai went away and carried out all of Esther's instructions. Esther said, fast and pray for me. All of you, every Jew that you can find and that you can get word to, Pray and fast for me because I'm getting ready to go to the king after three days of that. And if I perish, I perish. You know, God had Esther right where he wanted her to be. She wasn't just by happenstance made queen. God was directing this whole situation. Let me ask you a question. Why are you where you are today? God has a plan for where you are, the people that you know, the job you have, the people that you come in contact with, your neighbors. It's not just happenstance. Nothing is secular because God wants to make it sacred because you're there. I said it's because you're there. You're in that situation. You may say, but, but pastor, you don't know the heathens I'm around. That's why you're there. Because <laughs> they need Jesus. They need him. You're in a secular place to create a sacred space. <laughs> That's it. That's why you were created. So, there are no coincidences with God. Whatever your circumstances, whatever your place in life, God wants to use you in that place for his glory. Right now. Right now. Whatever you do, we just read it, do it heartily as unto the Lord and not unto men. You're there to do as unto the Lord, although you do your duty on your job, you take care of your family, but there's a more important reason. Again, you're in a secular place to create a sacred space. Every situation where you're placed by God is intended to be invaded by God because you're there. It's invaded by God because he lives in you. You may, you may work with all heathens. <laughs> Nobody there knows the Lord. Many places there are, there are other Christians. But even if that's not so, and you're the only one there, you're there for a reason. You're bringing God into that situation. You're bringing the presence of Jesus with you, who loves those people that you work with, or that are in your family, or whatever. But so many, listen... I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say, say, say something kind of strong. You ready? Somebody say, I can take it. <laughs> so many naturally qualified Christian people are too busy running around doing their own thing to be about God's business in their everyday life. Amen or oh me right there would work. Hey, I'm stepping on my own toes sometimes here. Oh, my. God has you, and he's placed you there, but we're too busy doing our own stuff to even hear the voice of God that's directing us to bring his presence into that situation. Anybody remember three guys named Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? In Daniel chapter 3, you can read that story there, Daniel chapter 3, but 
They were in a land kind of like Esther. They were in a land not their own. They had been taken into slavery there in that, in that land of that country. But they were full of the wisdom of God, and the king had granted them royal positions. Does this sound familiar? Sounds a little bit like Esther's story, a little bit. But when they wouldn't bow down to an idol that was set up, the decree was that they must be thrown into a furnace of fire. If you remember reading the story, you probably remember some of what they said. They said, you know what, king? We're not bowing down. We only bow down to God. God will deliver us, but even if he don't, we're not going to bow. Talk about taking your own life into your own hands, right? So to speak. And, and, they, and they got so upset at them for not bowing down, they heated up the fire seven times hotter than it was supposed to be originally, so much so that the people that threw them in the fire were killed. They weren't even in the fire themselves. They just got close, so close to it that they died. But then the king and everyone looking, I, somehow... Down through the years, killing Christians has become a spectator sport. Come on, you've seen even stuff on television in recent times where people would take Christians and put a hood over their head and they wouldn't show you the whole clip on the news. But they were getting ready to behead them. They had to record it. They wanted people to see it. And, you, and if you went on the right website, you could watch the whole thing. Killing and hurting Christians have, have, have always been a spectator sport. But. So they were watching and they were looking and the king looked over into the fire and he said, wait a minute, didn't we throw three men in the fire? They said, yeah, oh king, you're correct. Right? And he said, then why do I see four Four in the fire, and they're loose, and they're walking around. When the people that threw them in the fire died, not even being in the fire, just getting close to it. How is this possible? Their, their bonds were burned off, <laughs> and they were free, walking around the fire. And there was a fourth man, he said, in the fire. And they says, it looks like the Son of God. <laughs> Come on, somebody. They were in a secular place, but through God in their life, they created a sacred space where people had to see and know that God was real. Everyone knew what God had done. Then the king, after they came out, they came out without even a smell of smoke on them, the Bible says. And then the king promoted them. <laughs> he went from wanting to kill them to promoting them. Talk about a turnaround. Hey, you want to see a 180 in your life? Trust God and do what God says. <laughs> you, you may be headed for the fiery furnace, but God's going to bring you out and give you a promotion. Come on, somebody. <laughs> do you believe that today? Our God is able to do exceedingly and abundantly above all that we ask or even think. But we got to believe for it and we got to walk in the places that God has called us to walk. Too many times we want to just leave that place that God has put us because of all the heathens or because of all the situations, because it just is not comfortable or whatever. When God has put us there for a reason to create a sacred space in a secular place. We need to be not so quick to put on our parachute and jump out of the plane. Wherever that happens to be. You need, let, me, let me just give you a little bit of advice. You need to know God has told you to make a move before you make a move. Because the place that seemed like the worst spot that you could be might have been the very place that he planted you to bless you beyond measure. Amen. 
and you threw it away. So the king promoted them, and he declared this in Daniel chapter 3 and verse 29. He said, I make a decree that any people, nation, or language which speaks anything amiss against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be cut in pieces, and their houses shall be made an ash heap, because there is no other God who can deliver like this. How many of you know everybody knew about God because Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego stood up and did what they needed to do in that moment in time? They stood for what was right. They stood for God. Again, they were in a country that did not believe in God, did not care about God, did not make any provision for anyone to even worship God. You might say that in that place, everything was secular. There was nothing sacred except the people that honored God. But those three boys lived in this secular place, dedicated to God Almighty, doing whatever they did, heartily as unto the Lord and not unto man. You and I are meant to live that way too. When you live for him in a secular place, God in you will turn it into a sacred space. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Another story in the same book of Daniel, chapter 6. Remember Daniel and the lion's den? Daniel, like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, it was one of those that were taken captive to this foreign land that did not acknowledge God. And Daniel was over an area of the kingdom. He was a man that was full of wisdom, wisdom from the Lord. And and the king recognized it, and so he gave him a, a high position as well. And the king thought, if you read this story in Daniel chapter 6, the king thought to possibly set Daniel over the whole kingdom, him being the only one that was above Daniel. The other leaders were so upset about this, knowing that Daniel prayed to the Lord, they asked the king to make a decree that if anyone petitioned any god besides the king for 30 days they'd be thrown into, into the den of lions. In Daniel chapter 6 and verse 10, it says, Now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, the decree had been signed by the king, which means it could not be reversed. How many of you know God knows how to reverse things when they can't be reversed? He knew that the writing was signed. He went home, and in his upper room, with his windows open toward Jerusalem, he knelt down on his knees three times that day and prayed and gave thanks before his God. Key passage. As was his custom since early days. It wasn't that Daniel just thought, oh my goodness, I need to go pray. He was just doing what he did every day. And everybody else knew it. And they were trying to use it against him to get rid of him. Daniel, again, was in a secular place, a secular country, but he continued to pray to God daily, as was his custom. It got him in trouble, of course, as he was thrown into the den of lions against actually what the king wanted because the king felt pretty, pretty good with Daniel being around. The king kind of liked Daniel. And he, and he probably at some point then realized um, that he was tricked into doing this to get rid of Daniel. If you, if you know the story, God protecting him, protected him by shutting the mouths of the lions. You know, I'd like to know how God did that. Like, did he give them lockjaw or something? I mean, you know, like, you know. <laughs> what, what, I don't know. But it said he shut the mouths of the lions, right? So whatever, they they couldn't eat him. (laughs) They couldn't hurt him. And he was alive the next morning when the king worriedly didn't sleep all night because of the situation, came to check on Daniel. In Daniel chapter 6 and starting in verse 21, it says, Then Daniel said to the king, O king, live forever. My God sent his angel and shut the lion's mouths so that they have not hurt me, 
because I was found innocent before him. And also, O king, I have done no wrong before you. Now the king was exceedingly glad for him and commanded that they should take Daniel up out of the den. So Daniel was taken up out of the den and no injury was found on him because he believed in his God. I like that. No injury was found on him because he believed in his God. Verse 24, and the king gave the command and they brought those men who had accused Daniel and they cast them into the den of lions, them, their children, and their wives. And the lions overpowered them and broke all their bones in pieces before they ever came to the bottom of the den. It w Daniel wasn't saved because the lions weren't hungry. <laughs> right after he got out, they threw all these people in there and they didn't even make it to the bottom of the den before they were torn to pieces by the lions. It had to be God. See, God does things in a way that it has to be seen that it's him that accomplishes these things. Not, not the person. They knew Daniel couldn't have caused that to happen. They knew for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they couldn't have caused that to happen. It had to be, I don't even like to use this term, a higher power. It had to be God himself that saved them. Verse 25, then King Darius wrote, to all peoples, nations, and languages that dwell in all the earth, peace be multiplied to you. I make a decree that in every dominion of my kingdom, men must tremble and fear before the God of Daniel. Wow. Again, talk about a 180. Talk about a turnaround. See, listen to me. God can do that in your life. In your situation, where you are in that secular place, Daniel lived his secular life like it was holy before God. He did it heartily as unto the Lord and not unto men. God showed up, God showed out, and he showed everyone that he was in Daniel's life. That's what God wants to do in your life. When you live for him in a secular place, God will turn it into a sacred place space. Let's get back to Esther and our story about Esther. She goes into the king at the risk of her life. He extends the gold scepter to her, which means she's not going to die. But now she's got some crazy idea, scheme to ask the king to do, though. And the king, she had found favor with God, but that favor extended through, through her life, and she found favor with the king, extending the scepter. But also, the king asked her, what is it that you want? I'll give it to you up, up to half of my kingdom. Well, now come to think of it, there are some things I'd like. <laughs> right? I mean, wouldn't that be a temptation? Uh, right? It's a longer story. I encourage you again to read it for yourself. The whole of Esther is only 10 chapters. But, but Queen Esther revealed she wound up in the end result through some banquets and, and sitting down and eating together and those kind of things. She revealed who Haman really was and what he intended. And the king was so angry that he had Haman hanged on the gallows that Haman had built and intended for Mordecai to be hung on. Talk about a 180. Talk about a turnaround. And from that point, the king allowed Queen Esther to write a decree. He told her to write it. Have you read that? He told her to write it. <laughs> you write the decree that would allow the Jews to protect themselves from anybody that would want to attack them and even to fight back and kill their enemies who would, wanted to come against them with no repercussions. Esther was given a position. She was queen, a secular position in a secular nation for such a time as this to save God's people from annihilation. Esther's secular position was given to her by God, though. Think about it. 
The secular position was given to her by God. God is the one that orchestrated that her, she become queen. Not by happenstance. Not just as a job. Not simply a way to make her happy. Hey, I'm queen. Yay. Right? I get to wear fancy clothes and perfume and, you know, whatever. He had an eternal sacred plan for her in that sacred place. Esther's secular place, a position of earthly authority, became a sacred space where God worked and moved in a mighty way. God wants you to know that he plans the same for you in the place where he has you. You are not there by happenstance. You are not set in, pl in a place of authority or influence or substance just because. You're there by divine design. God placed you where you are to make you a holy, providential, sacred difference in an unholy, ill-fated, secular circumstance. He put you there so that there would be a 180 happening in that situation. Esther was there for such a time as this. You are where you are for such a time as this. This is the last days. R read your Bible. I don't know how much time we have left. No one knows the day or the hour. But Jesus said you'll know by the signs of the times, though. You can see it. And we're in these last days. And God wants to gather as many people into his kingdom as possible in these last days. But he's going to do it through us. He's going to do it through you. Somebody say he's talking to me. The rest of you, I'm talking to you. You watching online, talking to you. Wherever you happen to be, God has you there for a purpose, not just to waste time. Standing in line at the DMV. How about, how are you doing today? My name is Greg. What's your name? You know, God can open a door just in a conversation. You know, man, I'm going through a tough time right now. You know, this is happening, that's happening, and, you know, and then I had to come up here today, and blah, 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 whatever. You don't, you don't know what's going to happen. Hey, man, since we're going to be standing here for another 30 minutes, you know, can I pray for you? Can I pray for you? I guarantee you, somewhere between 90 and 95 percent of people will say yes. Secular place becomes a sacred space. When you find yourself there, step into it. Step up to the plate. God's got you set up. He set you up. Come on, anybody, anybody play volleyball? Bump, set, spike, right? The Holy Spirit puts you where he wants you to be, bump. Jesus says, get ready, set. Guess who gets to spike it? Come on, I always wanted to be the one to spike it. Oh, come on, right? God's, God's setting us up, and we're complaining about where we are. We're complaining about what's going on around us. And God said, you got to see what I, what I see. You got to... You know, I pray that about every day. God, show me. Let me see what you see. Come on. 
How about let's all begin praying that as we go through our day. Lord, today, let me see what you see. And I always, I always bring this caveat in. And I say, God, I know I can't see everything you see. It would blow my, literally blow my mind up. <laughs> right? But show me, though, what I need to see today. Show me what I need to see today. And if, and if, and if you do that, you'll see the bump and the set, and you get to spike it on the devil. Come on, somebody. Come on, somebody. Step up. Be bold for God. Go to your window and kneel down as is your custom and pray where everyone can see you if they're looking when the government says don't. You know what Daniel did? Approach the king, approach the boss, approach the authority, and ask for that God thing that God has placed on your heart. Open your mouth and share the good news. Invite people to Jesus. Invite people to church. Show them who God is by how you live your life around them. Get off your phone and open your mouth. Choose not to bow down to the directives of the devil. When you live for him in a secular place, God in you will turn it into a sacred space. Will you stand with me? This next, uh, this... This next, this week, we're going we're gonna to do something a little different in the midweek. I think, I think 